Greetings, friends. Welcome in the name of the risen Christ to this time of worship. Today, I will light a memory candle to celebrate the life of Lauren Gore, husband of Janet. We remember Lauren and the gift that he was to those who knew him, and we keep his family in our prayers in this time of loss. Life has its joys and its sorrows, and today I am happy to say that we celebrate with Dina Drinkle in the safe arrival of Brooke's little girl, Guiana, and we celebrate with Mary Light and family in the safe arrival of grandson, Josiah. The peace of Christ be with us all as we gather. Let's begin our time of worship in song by singing together number 222 in Voices United, 222, Come Let Us Sing. As sure as the sun rises and sets, so constant is God's love for us. As sure as the season changes, however belatedly, so dependable is God's mercy. God's love is steadfast and God's mercy endures forever. We worship God with joyful, thankful hearts and with faithful actions today and tomorrow. Let's pray. It is good for us to be together for worship, O oh God. Please add your spirit to our gathering so that we become strong and able to share Easter good news with the world. Thanks and praise and glory be to you, God of heaven and earth. Amen. Our next hymn, number 241 in Voices United, it's entitled, O Sing to Our God, this is a Brazilian folk song. It was translated into English by Gerhard Cartford, and the music was arranged about 30 years ago by the Iona community, John Bell. Number 241 in Voices United, O Sing to Our God, and I'll play a whole verse through before we start singing so that you can be reminded of this song. We have had it as a learning hymn in the past, but it's been a while.
Hello, my Time Up Front friends. It's a while since I've had a chance to chat with you, and it's a while since I've seen you. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the languages that we speak, the words that we use to talk about things. So I'm going to hold up two words, well, three words really, but two expressions, and I want you to think about these and when you use them. please, and thank you. Now, there are other languages in which those words show up. I'm going to ask you to repeat them with me, and maybe you know these. These are the French expressions for please and thank you. S'il vous plaît. Can you say that? S'il vous plaît. And merci. You probably have learned these words at school, right? Please and thank you in French. S'il vous plaît and merci. Well, how many of you know how to say please and thank you in Spanish? I know Rowan knows how to say this because she used to watch Dora the Explorer and there's lots of Spanish words in that program, right? Please in Spanish is por favor. Can you say that? Por favor. And thank you is gracias. Try it. Gracias. Por favor and gracias. All right, I have some more. And it's good that you're practicing these. I will explain to you later why it's good to practice them. Okay, this is, these are the Dutch expressions. Dutch was my, the first language I ever learned to speak, even before English. So if you want to say please in Dutch, you can say als du blieft. Als du blieft. One more time, als du blieft. And thank you is easy. It's bedankt. Bedankt. So now you know how to say please and thank you in, was that four languages? Yes, four languages. So please and thank you are the expressions that we use when we talk to God, right? We can talk about all things, all kinds of things to God. But sometimes it helps to think of our language with God, our, our prayer time, as being please language and thank you language. So usually when we're talking to God, we start with the thank you things because God has already given us so much. We really have so much to say thank you for. So whatever language we use, we can say thank you to God for all kinds of blessings, good things, and gifts. We can say thank you for our homes, our families, our church friends, our schools and teachers, our dance classes, our piano lessons, our crafts, nature, everything that's outside, the birds singing and the flowers growing. We have so much to say thank you to God for. And we can also say please when we talk to God, right? We can say the please things like, God, please help me to be brave. Please help me to be kind to the person that's giving me a hard time. Please help me to be cheerful and put a smile on my face. Please help me not to complain. Please be with me all the time. Oh, and thank you for being with me all the time. You see, please and thank you goes back and forth in our prayer conversation with God. 
And you know, it's really a special thing that no matter what language we use, God understands our pleases and our thank yous. I'm going to read now the scripture text for today from the Acts of the Apostles. I'm looking at the 10th chapter of Acts at the very end, the final few verses, beginning at 44. Acts 10, verses 44 to 48. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers, the Jews, who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the non-Jews, the Gentiles. For they heard those Gentiles speaking in tongues and extolling and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then those Gentile people invited Peter to stay for several days. Marking out boundaries. That's how we make sense of our world, right? That's how we figure out who we are and who we are not. That's how we protect what's important to us. We put up no trespassing signs and we build fences. We lay out boy lines to separate the deep end from the shallow end of the pool. We paint lines on the basketball court so we'll know what's out of bounds. We draw up family trees and we build customs offices and we describe which side of the railroad tracks we live on. These days, we close borders and collect vaccines to protect ourselves and fellow citizens. We articulate what is other from us so that we will be more sure of what us means and to keep what is ours safe. In today's story from the book of Acts, we get the tail end of a story that on the surface seems to be about Peter and what Peter's doing. But this is really a story about God and what God is like, what God cares about, and importantly, where God marks out the boundaries. Peter is just one of the characters who is used in the story to show us all how the church is supposed to act, how we are supposed to be like God. We're going to back up from this tail end of the story that I just read for you because it's important to know what happened before today's verse that says the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word while Peter was still preaching. So what happened to lead up to this event? Well, clearly the writer of Acts, who we believe to be Luke, Luke thinks that this backstory that comes before today's scripture is profoundly significant because the whole narrative takes up all of chapter 10, the whole chapter that comes before today's four verses. And then the same story is repeated all over again in slightly different language in chapter 11. So let's recap, because it's clearly important. Bear with me as I fill in the backstory. First of all, we have to bear in mind that Peter is a Jew. He's a Christian, to be sure, but he's a Christian Jew. That means that Peter has grown up in the traditions of Jewish boundary setting. Peter has learned that a Jew is a Jew is a Jew, not a Gentile. Gentiles are those non-Jewish, uncircumcised heathens. Hmm. Gentiles are people defiled by all those non-kosher foods that they eat. Gentiles are to be avoided at all costs by Jews because hanging out with a Gentile is enough to taint a good Jew. Now, maybe we're starting to feel a little critical of Peter and his fellow Jews at this point, or defensive, because after all, we are those Gentiles too, right? But let's be honest. We too put boundaries around who's in and who's out, even in our church life, sadly. Before God gets working on him, Peter would not have welcomed Gentiles into his congregation of Christian Jews. 
before God got working on our generation of Christian church, we would not have easily and fully welcomed, say, single moms or divorced people or folks who wore their barn boots or jeans to worship. That doesn't mean that we're not sincere disciples of Jesus Christ. And Peter, too, was very sincere. That backstory earlier in chapter 10 tells us that Peter was praying and meditating by himself up on the rooftop of Simon's house in Joppa. Peter's being faithful. For all his boundary setting, he's being faithful. He's spending time in prayer, opening his ears and his heart to hear from God. And God honors that. God meets Peter right there on the rooftop to teach him something. God gives Peter a vision, a whole new take on how God sees people and on how God deals with boundary marking. Peter doesn't actually get the message right away. God has to put it out there three times. Three times Peter sees a big sheet descending from heaven and on this big sheet are all kinds of non-kosher food. Non-kosher food, food not allowed to be eaten by Jewish people. Three times the Spirit of God tells Peter to help himself to the proffered food. And three times Peter recoils in disgust because all his life he has been taught to believe that there are clear boundaries in what you can and can't eat. And this is dirty food that God is pointing to. But God insists. God says, stop with all that line painting and fence building, Peter. I'm not into that kind of behavior, believe it or not. Peter is actually really confused by this. And understandably so, because it's very hard to undo a lifetime of tradition. We get this. We understand. I can think back on where I used to be theologically on some issues, and where I am today has taken me a while to get to. I grew up. I grew up with the notion that being gay was an abomination to God. Thankfully, God worked through some wonderfully gracious people to teach me that those are human boundaries, not holy boundaries. I also believed for a good part of my life that baptism was only for people who were mature enough to make a personal profession of faith. So I believed it was for adults. That's what I was taught. These days, I joyfully baptize all the little ones and older ones alike whom we welcome into the church of Jesus Christ. I once made judgments about who should or shouldn't partake at the communion table. Sometimes I excluded myself because I felt shame or guilt about something. But I learned that Jesus is a much more gracious host than I was and that all are welcome without distinction. None of these shifts happened overnight for me. It took time to dismantle those fences and to unpaint the lines. And it's not over. There are still times that I catch myself stereotyping people, for example, and making assumptions about them based on human categories of definition. Anyway, back to Peter. Poor, confused Peter, still puzzling over that vision of the sheet with all these different foods on it, still thinking, what are you trying to tell me, God? And God says, well, Peter, there are some non-kosher dudes downstairs knocking on your door. Go answer the door and let them in. Huh? Ah. Okay, I will do that, God, says Peter. And he does. Peter lets the other, that different one, into his space. He offers hospitality. For him, radical hospitality, right? Even while he doesn't have it all figured out, he opens the door to the stranger, to the one who is other. I could stop right there, and maybe that would be enough sermon. But maybe not, because the story in the Bible takes us further. Actually, it seems it's not enough to just open the door or to just scoot over on our pew and let that other person sit there. 
Do you know, for example, how many times I have heard people say to me, I have no problems with gays and lesbians and transgender people. They can sit on the pew beside me. I just wish they, I wish they wouldn't push for marriage in the church sanctuary, you know? Well, some time ago now, both Hillview and St. Paul's made the decision to offer folks from the LGBT2Q community the same access as heterosexual couples to our church sanctuaries for their weddings. Because over time, we clued into the vision that God is calling us into. Some of us are less comfortable with that perhaps than others, but that's how that sort of journeying goes, right? It takes time. In the Bible story, Peter was the ringleader. He had the big vision. God spoke to him. The other Jewish Christians who went with Peter to Cornelius' house, Cornelius the Gentile, those other Jewish Christians who went with Peter the next morning weren't quite so on board yet, but they seemed to have trusted Peter and they all showed up to preach. Well, sure, Peter's the one in the story who does the talking, I know, so you might think he's the only preacher, but preaching isn't just the words that come out of our mouths. There's a saying, it's sometimes attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, a saying that goes like this, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Words are an integral part of how we communicate the love of God, but just showing up can speak volumes. And apparently eloquent, as Peter's words are when he preaches in Cornelius' family room, Apparently, God wants to say something besides that, and the Holy Spirit interrupts Peter's sermon and does the job that God wants done. The story tells us, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. What a transformation. Incredible if we hadn't seen it with our own eyes. Peter's delegation of elders from the home congregation is astounded. Cornelius and friends are ecstatically praising God in a whole new language given to them by the Spirit. Peter sees this and he hears the penny drop, right? He totally gets it and he says, friends, we're going to have us a mass baptism. What a transformation indeed. Do you think anyone in Cornelius' house is worrying about barn boots or jeans or gender identity or sexual orientation or marital status? or ethnicity? And do you think that any of this would have happened if Peter hadn't been praying on Simon's rooftop? If he hadn't been open to a vision? If the congregation hadn't gotten on the same bandwagon? If Cornelius and friends hadn't been hungry to encounter the holy in their lives? If the Holy One hadn't orchestrated the whole event, would any of this have happened? What happens in this amazing story from Acts didn't just happen overnight, although it's kind of told that way, right? But it takes time for these things to happen, and the story is always ongoing. Transformation in us and in the church keeps on happening. It's not a one-time thing. It keeps on happening if we let it. If we let it. If we seek to follow and learn and grow if we spend some time on our rooftops praying, if we allow God to be part of the journey and to speak to our hearts, if we're willing to trust that God can take us into new places and we won't lose our identity, but expand it, if we will not only welcome the stranger, the guest, the one who is other, into our warm and comfortable to us places, once that's allowed, if we will not only welcome them, but also show up in their places, cross over into their yards, take a slice out of their pizzas, and be human together in the presence of the living, loving one who yearns for us to be family together without boundaries. Amen. Our hymn is from Voices United, number 606, In Christ There Is No East or West. I'm using the tune from 
Voices United 344 because it's more familiar to us. But the words are at Voices United 606. We're going to sing three verses. I realized that I forgot to tell the Time Up Front friends when I was talking to them why it was important to practice saying please and thank you in those other languages. So here's why. I'm going to come and visit you at your house and I will have a little treat with me to give to you. But before I give it to you, I would like you to say please and thank you in a different language. So practice. All right. Let's pause for a moment to think about gifts and blessings that are ours to share. And maybe think about some blessings that we would like others to share with us. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would transform our gifts, the things that we share, so that doubt may turn to joy, so that fear may become proclamation, and so that hate may give way to love. In the name of Jesus, we make this prayer and we offer our gifts. Amen. I'm going to ask you to join your hearts with mine as I lead in the prayers of the faith community. And I ask you also to join in with me at the end to say the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of life. For the gift of your Son. For the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lead us through the trials, the suffering and sorrow, the challenges and struggles, the tired times and the dark places. Be with those who weep or cannot sleep, with those who have no peace, with those who seek release. God, we lift to you now those whose names we carry in our hearts. Lead us, God, with grace, with love, with peace. Fill us with hope, with patience, with stamina. Transform us into your image. Transform us to grow, to understand, to see. Transform us that we can be made whole. And then in wholeness may we be the hands and heart of Jesus. Together we pray for the goodness of the kingdom to come for all, even as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is from Voices United. It's number 333, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Voices United, 333.
Let us go from this time blessed by God's love. Let us go to be God's love. Let us go as disciples of Jesus, connected to the vine, but branching out in loving and inclusive ways wherever we go. Amen.